I'm Jack Lucas Caffrey, and I welcome you to my two interviews with Frankie and Lorraine McDonald. I'm first going to start with Frankie, who you may know best for being the trumpet player of Joe Dolan's show band, The Drifters. In this interview, Frankie will be speaking about touring in Russia with Joe, playing in the army band for John F. Kennedy's trip to Ireland, and Frankie will also be speaking about his gigs with Brendan Grace. Frankie is filled with information, has to be one of my favorite interviews I've done, and so with that, I hope you enjoy this interview with Frankie McDonald. So, Frankie, how are you doing today? Hi, Jack. I'm great. I'm just looking out at the rain, and I'm inside and warm, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> First question I'd like to ask you is, because uh, I actually don't know this about you, uh, how did you get into music? Eh, hey, you know, people say they were born into music, and that's happened to me. I was born into music because uh, my father was a musician, played in a dance band. And uh, I I was born in Clonus. And he all, all his friends were musicians. And then, to answer your question a little bit further, uh, I was invited to join the brass band in Clonus when I was nine, which I did, and a couple of good guys, teachers, and playing with the boys, I got a lot of experience, did a lot of lo- local concerts, and it developed from there, you know. So I, I was lucky, really, like I had the music in the house, and then it, it, it went on to playing with the brass band, and dance bands and stuff so that's it and it seems like yeah all all of your kids seem to have had the same uh yeah well i suppose it's history repeating itself because all my friends were musicians and i had you know i had guys coming in practicing and playing and then i started a youth band i started a youth band in atlone around the mid 80s with another friend of mine uh we were in the army band together so I had left and he was sitting. So we started a little school of music and developed a bit of youth band. And we had our kids, there was about 30 kids from Atlone involved in the music band. And so my kids joined the band as well. So it stemmed from there, you know. Uh, but it's like everything else. They're hearing a lot of stuff in the house over the years, you know. Did I just hear army band? Does that mean that... Don't yeah. tell, were you in the army? Well, yeah, well, to bring you a bit really? further, after my clonus, <laughs> after, after my clonus reign... I played kind of, went to school and uh, I was always interested in music. I loved music and would follow a band. If there was a band in Clonus going through the town, marching band, I would follow it until they got into the bus about a mile outside the town. But to answer your question, my father saw an ad in the paper looking for uh, young musicians to join the Army School of Music. And uh, <laughs> I was 14 at the time and I says, yeah, I'll go for that. I was getting out of school. It was great, so... I, I did the interview, got in. Now I did school up there, but it was a whole musical school, army training. Bar, we didn't do any, uh, we were non-combatant. We never fired rifles, but we did everything else. Uh, so that was it. I went into the army school of music when I was 14 and I served for three years, passed out. And then I was sent to the number four, the Western Command Band in that loan. I served for about eight, seven or eight years. And in that time, I did the tour with uh, J.F. Kennedy. John Kennedy came to uh, Ireland, President Kennedy, in 1963. So I was one of the trumpet players that played at uh, Arbor Hill. I also played at Arson And that was, a, that was a magnificent memory to be involved. And as time goes on, I just see snippets on TV going back those years. And to be part of it, for me, a lifetime memory, especially when I see... Reeling back the years on the show, President Kennedy with De Valera and all these guys. And then things carried on. I did the usual army, brass band recitals, whatever. And uh, in 1968, I saw an ad for the Drifters that had broken up, split up. So so I followed through. Uh, they came to hear me, Joe and Ben Dolan. And the next day I was offered the job. And three weeks later, Gee. I was rehearsing for my new career which I thought might last, I don't know, a few years, but lasted 39 and a, and a half years. 39? <laughs> <laughs> so that brought you, that, yeah, the Joe Dolan thing, yeah. 
God almighty. And you did a lot of, you went uh, to a lot of places with Joe Dolan. I remember uh, someone told me they wanted to hear what it was like being in Joe Dolan's band in like Russia, I believe. Yeah, actually. We were the, in Russia with Yeah, them? we were the first Western band to, to, to go to Russia. 1978, <clears throat> we toured Russia. And uh, that came out of a, a tr- we did a concert in the National Stadium and the Russian ambassador happened to be there. <clears throat> he heard the program, Jeez. loved Joe's voice. Joe's voice was kind of continental and he uh, made arrangements that we would go to Russia on a cultural exchange where the Russian government sent over dancers to the UK and Ireland and uh, we were we did the tour in Russia and that was a huge experience. Not alone were we the first Western band, but we were just in at the deep end to try and figure out what kind of a program Uh Playing in stadiums. One time we were playing up in uh, St. Petersburg. Now it was called Leningrad then to 10,000 people Holy every moly. every night for about 12 nights. Uh, and we were treated very well. VIP treatment right through, you know. And have you went to other places with uh, Joe Dolan's band? Uh, any other yeah, well, you see, Make countries? Me an Island. Make Me an Island was the first hit record outside Ireland. Like we were an ordinary show band doing the circuit and doing covers like every other band, like Dickie Rock, the Miami, the Cadets, the Dixies, yeah. they were all doing covers. So we we got this number called Make Me an Island. Joe got hold of it, did an arrangement in England by a guy called Johnny Artie, good brass player, and put a lot of brass in it because he knew we had a brass section. And that went into number three in the British charts, which was phenomenal at the time. It was selling 20,000 wow. a day. That time... You sell, sold a lot of records to get up to the charts. So that was, that got to number three. And following that, we got tours like we went to South Africa in 71 then. We played in Israel. We played in Canada, America, all over Europe, Belgium, Holland, Germany. Uh, like we did, we did a lot of touring at the time. And what was your favorite place to go to? We did Vegas, of course. Well, Vegas was a different thing. Like it was <clears throat> Vegas is Vegas is bright lights, the whole thing. And uh, we just went into Vegas and it clicked. Joe went very, very well in Vegas and we got a second trip, offered permanent residency in uh, the Silverbird, but he just declined. Joe wow. was a kind of a home bird. He wanted to play, play golf at home with his buddies and do some work in Ireland musically. And that was it, you know. And looking back, it was probably a, a good enough decision. Because at the time, the bright lights, they don't last forever, you know. <laughs> As well, like, what was Joe Donovan like in person? Did you, I'm pretty sure since you did almost 40 years with him, you got to know him in person. So what was he, what was yeah, he like to you? Yeah, well, Joe was one of the guys. Like, Joe didn't, did, Joe didn't want a, any different treatment really on the road. Joe wanted to stay with the band, you know. There was one particular time we were in Switzerland playing at a Barvitza. <clears throat> uh, it's a coming of age of the young Jewish guy because at that time <clears throat> there was a Jewish company managing the band. So they put Joe up in probably the Five Star Hotel on his own and they put us up in a very good hotel. They didn't kind of skimp on us, the band. We were in probably a Four Star Hotel but Joe, after staying the weekend in the hotel, he says, I never want to stay on my own again. I mean, he was there. He, Joe would like company, you know. He just wanted to be with the guys. Now, that was the one time. But after that, we all booked in together, you know. There was always a good feeling in the band, a good morale. Sometimes we did, we never fell out, but we always had different views on arrangements. Some fellas say, look, at what about this? And I, I'd give my opinion. And you weren't always right, but you weren't always wrong, you know. So we kind of took our arrangements together and... Uh, what you hear on radio now is probably some of the stuff I've arranged or some of the stuff some of the guys arranged, you know. The live the live version Gee. that we did, like the big hits, you know. And uh, when I hear a record, I stand back and have a listen and <clears throat> I remind myself, you know, when we might have done this, how it went and how popular it was and whatever, you know. What do you think was the uh, the biggest hit that you had? Yeah, make me make me an island would be the biggest hit, you know, and that was uh, a couple of good tracks in that, but that was the biggest hit. Like, uh, 
Then <clears throat> different countries. There was a there was a tune on the album called uh, "You and the Looking Glass," and that went to number one in South Africa. It didn't really go that well. I mean, it went. It was an album track, but they loved it out there, and that that was the reason that we were touring South Africa in 1971 because that was a major hit, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, a tune called "Lady in Blue" was number five in France, so that sparked off a French tour. Uh, so various countries had their pet tunes from various albums. Like going back to Russia. We had no hits in Russia, but people got to like the fast, up-tempo stuff, like You're Such a Good-Looking Woman. And there was a song called Crazy Woman. And, you know, they all went very well. That's crazy how, like, in every single country seemed to have, like, a different hit song. Because usually, I've never heard that with an artist, because usually it's the one song they have yeah. that's globally like. But you seem to have, like... For a different country, they liked a different song. Do you know, Jack, you're quite right. Good. That, that's well, never heard that's that. well thought out. And you are right. And uh, in hindsight, when you look back, having said all that, Joe had a continental flair, flair to his voice. You know, he had that kind of a, you know, he'd fit in the continent with the, with the sound of his voice and people clung to him, you know. But different countries did go for different, different styles. And different tunes, you know. And you have done some other work after the Drifters. Uh, what was that like? Yeah, well, when Joe passed away, I I was offered a position with the Brendan Grace Show as an opening act. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> I had I was playing a kind of uh, when Joe passed away, I just had to do something else. I was still young enough to stay playing, and I formed a three piece band, playing hotel circuit, you know, around the Midlands maybe the odd wedding, maybe the odd drinks reception. <clears throat> and uh, Brenda's manager heard us one night and made a remark. He said, look, at good sound you have there, guys. So I challenged him, kind of jovial. I said, if you're ever looking for uh, an opening act, give me a ring. Tom Kelly, of course. And I didn't know Tom that well. So, uh, But three months later, I got a call. He says, I've got a couple of gigs for you. I'm going to try to see what you sound like, you know, so... <clears throat> those three gigs amounted to about 10 years. So I played right up to the end with Brendan, you know. Lord, may he rest in peace. Good guy to work with. I mean, f- mm-hmm. unbelievably funny. Uh, it was a great tour. We we toured kind of January and February and July and August every year, you know. So that was uh, that was good for me. It's kept me re- really in the circuit of uh, touring and especially with a very prominent act, and I used to meet mm-hmm. lots of people on the road and in the halls and in the concert halls that knew me from the Joe Dolan show. So <clears throat> I was really at home in that gig, you know. So after that, when Brendan passed away, like then back to kind of the hotel, girl, local girl singer and myself, we just did some work. And occasionally I played with Lorraine and Keith. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I wasn't extremely busy, maybe a couple of gigs a month, which was fine. <clears throat> I was happy enough doing that, you know, just to stay in some form of the business. Now, we might as well end it off with uh, a song that you worked on. So uh, which one of the many songs that you've done do you want to end it off with for a bit of airplay? Have you anything about Keith and Lorraine there? I have them all. I could Google it. (laughs) You could Google uh, You're Never Too Old to Rock and Roll. All right, then. Well, You're Never Too Old to Rock and Roll is coming up next. But Frankie, thank you very much for coming on and uh, enjoy your day. That was my interview with Frankie McDonald. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I was very surprised on how much he actually knew, like the amount, the the years he remembered and all the trips he remembered. It just was really cool. Frankie's actually writing a book currently, so when he finishes writing the book, I may have him back on for a chat again. But in the meantime, my next interview is with Frankie's daughter, Lorraine McDonald. Now, Lorraine definitely did not lick the talent from the ground, as she is a multi-instrumentalist and a vocalist, who you may know from her duo group Keith and Lorraine McDonald, and even the Honky Tonk Angels, which we will be speaking about. So, without further ado, I hope you enjoy my interview with Lorraine McDonald. Enjoy. So, Lorraine, how are you doing at the moment? 
Jack, I have to tell you something. I am doing fantastic. Loving life, loving every minute of it. So I suppose the first question I'd like to ask you, because I actually don't know this myself, uh, what actually got you into music? My dad started a youth band in Athlone and my neighbour was a flute player. Now my dad was sent to the Army School of Music when he was 12. He was a young, from Clonus, County Monaghan. And he got into music, he played with my granddad, he met my mom, and they got married and they played with Joe Dolan for 40 years. But when he moved to Athlone, he was in Dublin, he was sent to Dublin from Clonus, and he was moved to Athlone and he was heartbroken because he was a city boy. He loved the city and loved the city life, which I was really surprised to hear because he's quite a simple countryman at heart. And he anyway, he, he, he got into a lot of different things. When he came to Athlone, he got involved in a lot of different things. He got involved with... Uh, the special needs, he used to teach them how to swim. He was part of the school and he, he did it, involved in a lot of different things. So he got this brainchild himself and Mr Whelan was his name. He was a flute teacher and that's how I learned to play flute. And as a family then, kind of from the age of 13, we started a family band and my dad was playing with Joe Dolan, as I said, for 40 years and he was heading off to South Africa for six weeks. So he had a residency in, the, in, a, in a hotel in Athlone called the Prince of Wales Hotel and... Um, he, he didn't really want to let the residency go because he enjoyed it and he didn't want to stop the music and everybody enjoyed it. So myself and my brother kept the whole show going. And it was unbelievable because myself and Keith, we didn't have a huge repertoire. So we used to take music that we learned from our youth band days in and play as part of the uh, the Wednesday night. Now you take it, myself and Keith are in school. Like I'm 13 or 14 and he's 15. But we kept the whole thing going and it was fantastic for us because we progressed, we gained confidence and in that six weeks, you know, we had to introduce new program and build up the repertoire. We played with great musicians, great piano player, so we learned a lot from him and that's basically where it all started. Uh, so you're doing a bit of a show band work with uh, Ronan Collins last year. How is that? But to be honest, Jack, last year was our 11th year to do that particular tour with Ronan 11th? Collins. Uh-huh. Gee. 11th year. Uh-huh. And this year would have been the 12th year. So it's postponed now and, and 22. It's, it's going to be back on track. That is the most amazing tour. That, that starts from the 1st of January and it usually runs into the first week in, in March. But we take a week off because the cruise always comes in in around February time. And it's just, you know, everybody is just in such high spirits. Everybody just loves to sing. We love to meet up. Everybody gets on so well. The vibe on stage is just fabulous. Everybody gives it 100%. The artists, the audience absolutely love it. It's just easy. And it's so, so, so nice. So nice. So speak to me about the... uh particular um, instruments and uh, that you play you, you you seem to play quite a few yeah well the first first thing I did was learn was concert flute and I studied in school and I studied piano in school but that kind of fell by the wayside and funny I was going to I was dead keen on buying myself a piano during the first lockdown but it still hasn't happened but never say never um as kids we um my brother played drums and my other brother Keith played trumpet and sang so I wasn't very confident singer so my dad would make me sing not, you know not that he'd make me sing but he'd put he'd he was doing it out of my interest but I was just saying dad I just really don't want to do this I play the flute that's fine I enjoy that no problem but don't ask me to sing but anyway you know in in, in hindsight he was doing what he thought was best for me and of course they're always right you know you don't like to say it but they're always right then this song became really popular. George Michael, Careless Whispers, you remember? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Well, be- because Dad, because he had the, the youth and brass band, there was always there was trombones, there was French horns, there was euphoniums, there was saxophones, there was everything you could think of just lying around the house. So this, anyway, came, came out. and It was the eight, I was early 80s. And I remember we were doing a gig down at the Jolly Marner. It was an open-air gig down on the Shannon. And I'm da, 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 da. All right, so I said, okay, I found a saxophone. I can do this. <laughs> so that's where I that's where I learned to play saxophone. Hey. So I took it down, a few bum notes, but a few squeaks here and there, but had it. Got it. You see, you see, Jack, the fingering 
The embouchure, which is where you play your mouthpiece, is so different to the flute, but the fingers placement is are quite the same. So, and I had a good ear. And that's how I learned to play sax. So that's basically it. Flute, definitely my main instrument. Sax, biggest chance ever, but I have a good ear and I can belt out a belt it out, no problem to me. And uh, yeah, I can sing. Not only can you play a bunch of instruments as well, you also seem to be have been in a bunch of bands. How many bands have you actually <laughs> been in? Well, you see, a lot of a lot of our bands were literally the same people. Like, it was always the nucleus was always like Route One Hundred One was our first band, so that was our family band. That was our corporate band. We did all corporate events and weddings and jazz. That my dad was with us for that, and then. Dad went back. He left Joe for a year just to kind of get us up and running and get us on the road. Then he went back with Joe and we kind of took it ourselves. And then we we went, yeah, we were called Greece. Then we had a rock and roll band was called Greece. I don't know what we called the country band. I don't think we really called it anything. There's a like Keith and Lorraine sing country. And <laughs> then uh, the, the main, the final thing was Keith Lorraine and the show band show. And... Uh... You're also in another band as well. I was doing a bit of research on you called the Honky Tonk Angels. Talk to me about you know, that. Jack, I've forgotten what I've done. I was <laughs> I was in, actually, I played with a band from Galway for 12 years called The Conquerors. Oh. And the Honky Tonk Angels. That was great. That was a bit of fun because uh, there was three girls. There was Bernie and Cece and myself. And each of them had their own individual careers and they were all doing their own individual things. So it was like a, Let's just get together, have a bit of fun, record a few songs, record a few videos. We did a few gigs and we did a few little tours. We did a couple of Scottish tours and just fun. Just a lot, a lot of fun. You've met uh, a couple of people in the country uh, music industry, such as uh, Daniel O'Donnell and Nathan Carter and those. Uh, Talk to me about them. How are they? You know, when you meet people and you work with them, you know, you, everybody is perceived when they're on the stage that they're untouchable or, but everybody, they're so nice. They're so genuine. They're so down to earth. Like Nathan is just, he's just a young boy. Like he's 30. He's a young man. He's a young man. He's an entertainer. He lives life, loves life. He's amazing at his job. He gives his job 100% and he loves to have fun as well. Cracking guy, great personality, great smile, great musician. Fantastic musician, great piano player, great accordion player, wonderful musician and a smashing guy. Daniel, Daniel is actually probably one of the funniest person people I've met, believe it or not. He's so quirky and he is actually so, and he doesn't realise how funny he is. He's a great character and still hugely professional. Everything he's ever done, as you can see when you look at him from the minute you see him to his performance, everything is just smooth, charismatic and polished. I learned that Daniel O'Donnell was actually funny. Who knew? Oh, I swear, he's, he's so quirky. He is actually so funny, really and truly, yeah. So you're going to be releasing a compilation album very soon. So uh, talk to me about that, Lorraine. So we're going to compile, like you're going back, you're going back to 80 or 90, 96, 94. And even before that, since we first recorded, so we're just really going to gather everything up. Um, I, I'd say we'd have like 40 tracks on the album. Ooh. A lot of covers, but equally a lot of originals too. And we're in the process of that at the moment. It'll probably be another. We, we'll hopefully have it by the end of the month. Pictures, the whole, the, all the title, get it remastered. So all the levels are, you know, yourself have to be mm-hmm. the same. And get a new photograph and just repackage it and um, put in the new tracks that both Keith has recorded, I have recorded put it all together we're going to add in some of our dad's tracks that he has recorded That's just really have a family affair just call it the mcdonald's because we've done a lot in music all through our lives so we might as well just put it out there do you want us to play any track of yours any track from any of your bands your solo work your work with keith what do you want to what do you want to play if you want to play a song if you could play a song i would love a song by my brother keith mcdonald and i really really absolutely love the way he sang the song it's an incredible recording it's got a lovely meaning it's spiritual it's called over and over all right well there you go over and over is coming up next but lorraine thank you very much for coming on and uh yeah we'll see you soon and yeah jack thanks a million thank you